Well, good Wednesday evening, everyone. Welcome to Bowling with the FEF, a platform to share your unique bowling story live on our YouTube channel. It's a Wednesday night uh, on a week where a lot of people are starting up bowling league and kind of getting back into the swing of things. Some of us, after about a year and a half of not doing it. So good luck to those of you who are uh, bowling in league starting this week. Maybe you started earlier in the week. Maybe you have yet to start. My first league night is tomorrow night. I can't tell you how pumped up I am. Uh, but uh, yeah, best of luck to you uh, and uh, your buddies, your teammates, everybody else in this bowling season. Can't wait to get started. And uh, as uh, you may have seen last week, uh, we did a great interview with Brooklyn Rob Pirashad on Sweep the Rack. Uh, he came on with a great bowling story, and uh, I tuned in last Wednesday just to, just to see if they'd mention it. Um, it was their Season 2, Episode 41 called Big Bags. Wow, they did a great breakdown of our show. Uh, went, you know, really piece by piece, segment by segment. Uh, Rob and Big Mike really uh, paid a lot of attention to it, about 10 minutes into that show. Um, I'm going to throw the uh, link up in the comments here, if I can get that far. There we go. Uh, so you can check it out. They also have a new show coming up. Uh, tonight at uh, 7 o'clock Central. So if you're a fan of bowling, uh, a fan of an entertaining take on the sport, as uh, many of us are, uh, be sure to check them out. Again, Sweep the Rack uh, Season 2. That'll be Episode 42 tonight for them. And by coincidence, we are on our Season 2, Episode 42 as well. And I am really excited uh, to bring on our guest. He comes to us uh, from Ridgeway, South Carolina, uh, he is Chuck Gardner, uh, and in, in an episode that we're calling The Truck Stops Here. Chuck, how are you doing tonight? I'm great, man. Hope you are. Absolutely. Like I said, couldn't be better and really excited to kick off another bowling season. Um, they call you Chuck on the Truck, and you are, of course, the Brunswick Pro Staff Tour Rep, but how did that whole nickname start? Was it just something that happened, or is there a story behind it? Well, it was actually Nick Smith, our, our marketing guy for Brunswick, uh, came up with that with that tagline. And, you know, because we're always, on, you know, we're on a tractor trailer mm -hmm. um, where, all the tra where all the bowling balls are. We're laying out the bowling balls. And uh, there was some kind of a picture that one of the players took of us loading the balls or, or it might have been a video. And I was up on top on the top of the truck and they were handing the case boxes up to me and and Nick came up with this chuck on the truck thing and started the Facebook page for it. And, and it, it's been fun. It, it's, it's been interesting. Um, I, I think, uh, I, I don't think, I don't think I did a great job with it, to be honest. I think, I, I think maybe deep down inside, I thought it was a little hokey. So I, I think, <laughs> I think I didn't uh, do what I should have done and just, done a better job with it and and made it more fun even uh, but i've got it on some of my jerseys on the sleeve it says chuck on the truck on some of them and it's just fun um but i, I there's a decent following on on social media but i do a really poor job keeping up with it and uh just just so busy but that's yeah. that's how it started nick smith when you get to be in a lot of places on social media to to try and keep them all updated and up to you know current oh you could drive yourself crazy yes sir pardon the pun driving yourself crazy <laughs> so the day i created the link for this live stream in the corresponding event i got a text from brent prentice and uh, brent was our episode 26 guest he was a high school teammate of mine uh and he's also the proprietor at cedar vale lanes in egan minnesota and uh he comes at me with he's awesome the most helpful, genuine man in bowling, in my opinion. Is that something that you work at that you try to be? Or is that something that naturally just comes out of you? Um, I, I, think, I think when I look at the sport of bowling and I look at my life, I look at every day, can I do something to make it better than it was the day before? whether it's the little things or the bigger things, um, I want to make sure when I'm gone and, and, and 
my replacements are out there and they're they're running around that 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 I made some sort of a difference and and I I, I yeah I love Brent Brent is speaking of genuine human beings that guy's awesome I love that guy I love that PWBA event there it's so great and uh, Brent and his whole staff are so awesome but I don't I don't think I I don't think I think about it too much I I just think about that I want to make bowling better. And yeah. uh, I just, I just, I, I think every day that if all of us, if every person thought about making bowling better every day, how unbelievably great it would be. And, and it's, it's already great. Um, but I think there's so many things we could do to, to make it even better. Sure. Um, I want to keep going on that topic of, of Brent and uh, the PWBA Twin Cities Open because he's got a great story for that. Um, this past season, of course, we ran a, a series of interviews leading up to that tournament in April, and uh, the tournament went on, uh, d- albeit with no fans. So you have this kind of eerie, maybe quiet bowling center as these ladies are competing. Brent tells me, you know, the one main thing that I knew Chuck was just a super person is when we were hosting our event and we had no fans. So it was very, very, very quiet in the bowling center. Only a few of us were in there, but Chuck made sure that he walked up and down the concourse and cheered on everybody. So if he saw a strike or someone with a string of strikes, he made sure no matter what staff they were on, it didn't matter. He was just there for all the gals, and that was so awesome to see. We didn't need hundreds of people in the stands. They had Chuck. (laughs) And the gals had masks on, but you could see the smiles through them. Wow. What what do you remember about uh, about, uh, that event and and all that? Well, I do remember it was eerie. Um, It was very very eerie and very different. not having fans and we didn't have fans in Texas when we were in January, but you know, we, we actually thought by then we might start having fans. So we were pretty excited because they have a great fan base there. Um, when the PWBA is there, the place is packed and everybody has a great time. And, uh, but I, I I just remember that, you know, again, I, I just want people to feel, feel comfortable and feel, uh, feel like what they're doing is important and that it matters and that it matters uh, just as much uh, for the ladies that wear a crown on their chest as it does to the ladies who wear a lightning bolt. And, and I just, I, I just think it's important that we're all in this thing together. Yeah. I I really believe in that. Um, I believe we're all in this thing together and we can all make a difference. And, and uh, I, I like encouraging people. I, I really, it's, it's fun to encourage people and, and, uh, see them react when you encourage them. So yeah. that's, that's fun. You, you gave me an excellent segue again. I want to talk about one of those ladies with a, uh, with a crown on her chest. And, uh, that is Dasha Kovalova who ended up winning that event. Um, she told me that you are a great mentor your emotional support is very, very good. And we all know his famous loud claps that you could hear from across the bowling alley. Uh, is the loud clapping thing something that was new at that event, or does that go back a ways? Oh, that's for years and years. <laughs> it's uh, it's the same clap I've been doing uh, ever since I've been a tour rep. I think, I think it's important to acknowledge and let your players know that you are seeing what they're doing. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's one of my, one of my things that I, I think you want your players to know that you're behind them. And so I developed this clap many, many years ago. It's very simple. It's just three claps. And for some reason it's, it's, it really does seem to carry kind of loudly. And, uh, but it's the same all the time. It's, I don't clap like, you know, like, like doing this, I don't, I just don't do that. It's a, you know, when they, they throw a five bagger, it's the, and that's it. It's the, they know I'm there. They know that I'm paying attention. Um, they know that I'm, in, I'm in it with them. They know that we're in this thing together. And, uh, and the, the other thing is, I think 
sometimes your, your players, I, I know that I did as a player, I, I wondered, was, was my rep ever like paying attention to what I was doing? Like, did, did he ever really watch me? Or, or did when I came over and said, hey, uh, this is what I'm thinking. And what, what do you think of this? And my rep would always go, yeah, it's, that's good. And I'm like, yeah. and I'm like oh. so I, I want them to know that I'm that I'm engaged. Um, because I am engaged. I, when I'm at an event, I work and it is, it is from early until they're all done and, uh, nothing else matters. I don't answer my phone. I don't return messages. Um, I get, people get frustrated with me because if a squad's going on and it's a, it's a six game block or an eight game block, you are not getting an answer from me until those eight games are over. It's that simple. Cause I don't look at my phone. Um, I'll occasionally pull it out and do a video. If, uh, if one of the players has, you know, pen- potential to shoot 300 or something happens, I'll take a video and I'll send it off to Nick and, uh, then he can put it on the Brunswick site or the hammer site or whatever site that, uh, fits for the player that's, uh, that's on that team. Yeah. But, uh, that's, but I stay engaged. I, I want to stay engaged. I think it's it, it's our job to be engaged and understand our players and, and help them. Do you look at being engaged like that as a coach in a similar manner as you would being engaged as a player? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I really absolutely 100% do. I, I, I see players that uh, sit there and – piddle on their phone um, while they're competing and I go how do you do that like Mm -hmm. how do you how do you keep your mind um, focused on the job at hand when you're texting somebody or you're talking to them about whatever it is you're texting them about or or just scrolling social media um, or whatever it is you're doing I don't know how you keep your brain engaged in the process that you're trying to, you're trying to win a professional event. You're trying to make the cut. You're trying to, you're trying to dig your way out of a bad game you have going on. So, you know, you're, how do you stay engaged if you, if you're focused on other things? And uh, so, yeah, I, I look at it very, very similar. Yeah. Lots of distractions out there, especially now. Um, you know, you hit it right on the head. Social media can be, it can be distracting. Sure. Um, you're originally from Florida. Uh, tell me about your beginnings in the sport. How and when and where you got started. Well, I I started in this sport very, very, very young because um, my, my parents bowled. And... Uh, Neither one of them were any good, um, but they bowled. They were league bowlers, and uh, I kind of got away from it. Um, you know, I bowled, bowled juniors a little bit, and I, I piddled with it. But uh, but I, I played football and I raced motocross and and I did a lot of other things that kept me, uh, kept me so busy, and I kind of got away from bowling, and. Uh, and I, I got back into it in my in my late teen years, um, probably I don't know, maybe 16, 17 uh, years old. And I I met up met some guys, and uh, they were pretty cool guys. And I got to um, I got started bowling with them, and uh, and I just I just enjoyed it, and I had a I, I had a little bit of a knack for it, and it was fun, and and uh, I got to bowl in some of the better leagues around West Palm beach and, and even in Broward County. And, um, I bowled with Joe Furpo and, and Del Warren and Jimmy Keith and, um, just a lot of those guys growing up and, and, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and I, I don't know, I just, I got okay at it and I started to go and bowl a couple regionals and, and, uh, I'll never forget my first regional I ever went to. That was back when they still checked hardness of bowling balls. And, <laughs> and I went with my two bowling balls and I uh, couldn't afford a double bag. So I had two single ball bags and, uh, <laughs> and I had 
had my little wind jammer bags and I walked in there with my two bowling balls and, and I'm waiting in line to check my bowling balls in at my first tournament I ever bowled. And, and, uh, it was pretty funny. I, I got up there and they punched the ball and the first one was a caramel white dot and it barely passed. And, uh, cause it had to be 78 hardness then. And it, it barely passed. It was like just hitting 78. And oh. my next ball was an LT 48. And I'm like, Oh man, if that, that LT 48 is my hooking ball. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> the Marvel white dot was my straight ball. And so I, it, it was just, it, and it, it failed miserably. Oh, oh um, no. But I had, I had it in the car. So, you know, I had it in the trunk. We drove to the West coast of Florida. I lived on the East coast. So it'd been in the trunk for several hours. So, uh, one of my friends told me a, a trick, you know, take it, you know, the old school air conditioning units in the hotels that, you know, they were, they sat up against the wall and you'd you know, just set it on top of the air conditioning unit overnight and then bring it in and get it checked in the morning and brought it in, checked in the morning, it passed. So everything was mm-hmm. golden. So I got to use my LT 48 and then the lanes were flying. So I never threw it. Anymore. So <laughs> I threw my caramel white dot the whole tournament. So. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's incredible, and it's funny that you talk about the the hotels that used to have that. I've stayed in some that still do. <laughs> yeah, I, I have too, actually. <laughs> um, you know, are there any coaches that kind of really helped set the foundation for what you would become in the sport, and maybe even who helped set the foundation for your the coaching that you ended up doing? Yeah, um, you know. It, I think I think the two guys that were the most influential in getting me interested in coaching and and wanting to be um, to understand the game more uh, were Del Warren and Mo Pinnell. Um, Mo t- spent a lot a lot of time with me and uh, the hours and, and and obviously Del did too. Um, but you know Mo Mo was older than I was. He was. Um, a little wiser, obviously, than Dell and I were back in the day, and um, so I learned a lot from from Mo and Dell. Um, but when it comes to being a tour rep, um, I would say my the biggest mentor for me uh, would be Dell Ballard. Um, Dell Ballard was uh, the best I'd ever seen. Um, Rick Benoit was absolutely fantastic too. Um, <clears throat> Rick was very, very technical and, uh, I'm pretty technical too, but Rick was very, very, very technical as a rep and Dell did both. Dell was a, he was a bit of a cheerleader. Um, he was a, um, he was a guy that you could, uh, that you could come to with your concerns and talk to him and he would listen. And uh, so Dell was kind of my, my guy when I decided that I've really thought I'd like to be a tour rep. And I, I think um, when that happened, when I got to spend time with Dell, I learned an awful lot, but, um, but Mo, Mo was probably the most influential as far as knowledge and, and understanding ball motion and understanding layouts and, and just how to accomplish what we want to accomplish in, in, in the motion and, and what the player wants to see. Cause I think that's, that's the biggest hurdle we deal with as a tour rep, uh, making, making the player comfortable sure. uh, so they can repeat shots. Yeah. Um, is there something that you remember about the sport that really hooked you? I mean, was it, you know, hanging out with friends? Was it the ability to, like you said, repeat shots or make spares? Uh, was there something else about the sport of bowling that, that really kind of got you like it does for most of us who stay in, in the sport a long time? Wow. I, I, I think, I, I really think it was, it's more the people. Um, I mean, I, I thought it was cool to hook the ball, like, uh, and, and and I, you know, I I threw it slow. I could hook it, and it was fun, and uh, you know, had had a lot of fun with with creating shapes with bowling balls. That was fun to me, and and then learning 
about what created them and, and how it happened. Um, but I, I think what's kept me in the sport so long is the people. Um, I, I just think there's a lot of um, really great people in our sport. Um, I think I think there's way more great people in our world than we than we focus upon as a, as a society right now. Um, so I, 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 I think, I think that it's really been mostly the people and, and, and I've, you know, I've worked for two unbelievably amazing companies. I mean, I, you know, I, I worked for Columbia industries, uh, in our sport and, you know, the Hermans were wonderful people. Um, they, they treated everybody at Columbia industries, fantastic, wonderful. Um, everybody that I worked with there was, uh, they were just second to none. They were just so good to me. And, and then when they got bought by Ebonite, um, you know, when you're, when you're growing up and you're a young guy and you, uh, you think about, you want to be in bowling someday. And the natural thing to think about is, uh, you know, I want to work for Brunswick. I mean, Brunswick is bowling. Like, yeah. there, there's nothing else but Brunswick when it comes to the entire the entirety of the sport. Um, now, it may be different today because Storm is so popular, um, and so many people. You know, they they have a legion of fans, and it's 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 wonderful to see. You know, Storm just celebrated their 30 years in the industry, uh, which is pretty cool. And, uh, and Bill Christman is a, a wonderful guy and I have great friendships, uh, with so many people at storm. So, uh, but when you're, when you're older, like my age, um, storm wasn't around then they weren't around. So you, you, the, the only companies you had to really look up to are Brunswick, Columbia industries and Ebonite international back then. And, uh, so I never had any, uh, attachment to ebonite um i i i just thought brunswick was the coolest thing ever but i i really enjoyed columbia because they had the coolest sales rep ever uh back in back in the 70s and 80s a guy named bobby ridings was our sales rep for columbia and uh he'd come into the pro shop and he was so cool to be around and um and he just was a neat guy and and uh the sport was very different then um I tell young people this all the time and they, they laugh hysterically at me like I'm a lunatic, but I never, I never got my first free ball in my life until I'd made a top 24 on the pro bowlers tour. Wow. Ever. It's just the industry was different then. Mm-hmm. You didn't, they didn't hand out bowling balls like they were, like they were candy. Um, it's just, it did not happen back then. And uh, if you were on staff with a ball company, that meant you were on the pro bowlers tour. There was no such thing as amateur staffs and there was no such thing as regional staffs that just didn't exist. And uh, so if you were on staff with a ball company, you were, you were a pro bowler, you bowled on the pro bowlers tour. And uh, so I'll never forget it as long as I live. Big Steve Cook. I, I, I wanted to drill one of those blue hammers in the worst way, man, worst way. And, uh, I'd bowled pretty good. The first couple of weeks I was on tour that summer, summer swing back in, I don't remember what, even what year it was, it was a long time ago. Um, and, uh, big Steve said, Chuck, you're a nice guy and you throw it good, man, but you got to make top 24s before I can give you a ball. It's that <laughs> simple. You're going to have to make do with what you got. <laughs> and, uh, so next week I made top 24 and I got myself one of them blue hammers uh-huh. and uh, I thought I'd hit the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. And yeah. Steve, Steve Cook is a tremendous, tremendous talent. I remember watching him when I, you know, when I was growing up and wanting to, you know, throw the ball like that. I'm right-handed, but you know, you know, he, he was a beast yeah. and he's, he's, he's a great guy. You know, he's still in the industry and uh he's got a distributorship and he, he's 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 a great guy and uh just good people yeah um let's get back and kind of reset this whole thing about uh, about del warren 
Um, I asked him about your friendship, which you said kind of started when you were kids. Uh, he said that it, it's been wonderful to see the both of us have had good careers in the bowling industry. Uh, the fact that we're from the same hometown, fell in love with bowling at an early age. Uh, he says he's often thought about your path, how you started out dreaming about the Pro Tour when you were kids, and how many great players actually came out of the West Palm Beach area. A and then both you and him, you know, the stars align, or you both outwork everybody else or whatever, end up with careers in the bowling industry. And, and he called that pretty cool. Uh, what do you remember about, uh, about meeting Dell and, and striking up that friendship with him? Oh, you know, he, he was, he was so much better than I was. So as a bowler, so like, I, I remember, I remember meeting him. I think the first time I ever met him was at a, at a phase pro shop, a, a little pro shop down in Lantana and he worked there. And I think that's the first time I ever met him. I'd seen him bowl. I'd, uh, I'd seen him in some bowling centers. He was a, he was a youngster but he worked in the pro shop and, and, uh, he drilled me a ball. I went there to get a ball drilled and he drilled me a ball. And, uh, Nate, uh, who owned the pro shop back then, this is again in, in the seventies. Um, and so I, I, that's where I met him and we struck up a friendship right away. And, uh, we used to, uh, once, once I got a little bit better, um, we would travel Well, we used to bowl, like every night we, we bowled, bowled matches every night. Um, we had, we, it was so many fun action matches and stuff in, in South Florida back then. Um, we had a guy named J.O. King. J.O. was the best, man. This guy was so much fun. And Ron Dixon and Joe Furpo and Tony Yarborough. Um, we had so many good bowlers come, um, Ron Constantino, um, so many good bowlers that came out of that area. And, uh, so we would, we always had things to bowl. We we're always bowling action. Uh, Bruce Smith had these pin count tournaments and Dell and I won several of those pin count tournaments. And, um, it was just fun. It was just fun getting to, to, to be part of that group. And, uh, kind of, I grew up as a baby in the sport, even though I was a little bit older, um, you know, I'm a year older than Dell and, uh, but we, uh, you know, we kind of grew up in the sport, but he was way ahead of me, uh, as far as talent and, and, and he'd been in the sport way longer than I had, but, but I learned a lot from him and, uh, I learned a lot from a lot of these guys around, around the West Palm beach area. And, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun growing up in that, in that bowling, in that market. Yeah. Did uh, did you bowl in, in high school or at the college level, or were you just kind of on your own at that time? Yeah, on my own. I I um, never bowled in high school. Never never even really thought about going to college. I was a degenerate. I I, <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, it, college never was in the equation for me. Um, <laughs> if <laughs> no, it just wasn't going to happen. I, um, my family could have never afforded it and I couldn't, uh, envision, um, I, I got it. I went to, uh, vocational school and, uh, I became a certified auto mechanic, um, out right out of high school. And my ex-wife's father had a, uh, had a really big uh, Amco gas station uh, in Boynton Beach and I went to work there and twisting wrenches and bowling on the weekends and and uh, that's kind of kind of how it started and um, but now going to college was never in this cards for me sure you uh, you know you talk about that first regional that first top 24 i mean if you're you know in the mid to late 80s there that's like one of my favorite periods in the history of of pba bowling i mean i started getting into it you know you're probably crossing paths with dave Husted and marshall holman and mark roth and wayne webb and it's before the advent of reactive equipment uh, tell us a little bit about how the strategy was different uh, back then how you as bowlers had to plan for 
the inevitable changes in conditions without the equipment that we have today. Yeah, it was it was really different. Um, <clears throat> the whole approach to the sport was different um, because spare shooting was uh, such an important part of everything that we did. Um, keeping it in play, figuring out a way to throw uh, a double every game or maybe if you're lucky you get two doubles every game um you know the scoring pace was way different then uh the lanes were harder and the equipment wasn't as good so you had to really focus on being able to change speeds bowlers that couldn't change speeds back in those days were never going to be very good and that was the beauty of guys like David Ozio, Dave Husted, uh, Wayne, uh, just so many of them. They were so good um, at speed control. You know, they would just throw it slower. If it wouldn't hook anymore, they just throw it slower because you couldn't just grab the, the skid flip ball that was in your bag um, and because they just didn't exist. Like, I remember one time that Dell and I were traveling across the country in his van and uh, I was in the back of his van, like looking at bowling balls and, and stuff. And I, I remember him having five wine U dots. And five wine U dots were all drilled a little bit differently. But like you would put a completely different drilling in a ball back then, and it would hook, I don't know, a foot sooner, and it would hook like a board more. Yeah. It was not like today when we we put a, a a big strong layout in a bowling ball. You could you could drill one with, let's say, a slower response ball, and, and the same ball drill drill it a slower slow response drilling and a quicker response drilling, and you could see three or four feet earlier hook or later hook, and five or six boards more or less hook. And just by drilling the same bowling ball today, um, yeah. that did not exist back then. That just didn't exist. Um, and, and and it's funny that there always was that one special bowling ball. Like you know, you had to have one. Um, so if you if you think back, you know, like a couple of the rhinos, you had to own one. Like you just absolutely had to own. Them. Um, you had to own a black U dot nobody that ever was any good back then didn't own a black U-Dot. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, you just, you had those special bowling balls and, and, uh, but it was a totally different philosophy for the game. We thought about it differently. Um, you, when a, when a guy back in the eighties missed a spare, it was, they were like, Oh my God, I cannot believe I missed that spare. Today, I watch some of these young guys, or even the young ladies, they whiff a spare, and they're, eh, yeah, well, you're going to miss some once in a while. And because they know a five or six bagger is around the corner for them. Mm -hmm. If they grab the right ball, and they get into the right zone, and they get their speed right, five or six baggers right there around the corner for them. They're, so it's, it's just different. It's a whole different thought process. Yeah. So then in the early 90s, you guys start using reactive balls. What, uh, what do you remember about, you know, really having to make that transition to stay competitive? Yeah, um, I remember when Tony Westlake, one of my really good friends, and uh, I love Tony. And if he listens to this, he's going to think that I'm bashing him. And I, I am not. I remember when that purple thing came out and there was only a couple guys that had them. And all of a sudden, Tony Westlake was Mark Roth like, <laughs> overnight. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I love this guy. He's, he's my, one of my great peeps, but he's, he's hooking an Excalibur all the way across the lane. <laughs> and uh, Mark McDowell, mm -hmm. Mark McDowell, what, wouldn't I'm, Mark might have been the first one to win with the next caliber, or it might have been Westlake. It was one of those two. And uh, all of a sudden, these guys are are hooking it around 
us guys that 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 hooked, you know, urethane. Um, but I mean, I did it because I threw it slow. Del Ballard, Del Ballard had rev rate, but he also threw it slow. Like speed control was so important. Well, now all of a sudden you get these reactive resin balls, and you can just fling them. And uh, but I will tell you, it wasn't. <laughs> There's the slow boat going out. <laughs> the, 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 um, but the reactive resin, you know, some people adapted to it really, really quickly and it made some careers, right? Like mm -hmm. all of a sudden people were like, oh my God, look at this. This guy's unbelievably good and had been working his whole career to be that good. And it just fit his eye better. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that reactive resin made people you know, better than they were because they were, they were all great. You, you weren't out there if you weren't great, you had to be pretty darn good. Um, but some people, it took a lot, a lot, a lot harder for them to adapt to it. Um, Walter Ray, you know, a lot of people say, Oh, if it wasn't for reactive resin, Walter Ray wouldn't have as many titles. He does that. Eh, you guys are <laughs> cracking. You guys, you know, something's wrong with you people. You're broken. Uh, that guy is, unbelievable pete weber unbelievable and they didn't adapt right away to reactive resin um they really didn't i remember helping mark roth at a couple of events when he came out and started bowling pba 50 stuff and uh man he he used to go chuck i don't get this man i don't understand these bowling balls they are just so different and uh and it was it, it's it was a different world because they they didn't hook as early, so your your the shape that you saw in the bowling ball was so different than what you're used to seeing. Um, like in my mind, it's like, oh, it's never going to hook. It's it's never going to hook. And then all of a sudden, it's four through the middle. I'm like, oh God, <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord, help me. <laughs> I, why did it do that? <laughs> and uh, but when you see it at 35 feet or 40 feet you go oh my god it's never gonna hook it's gonna 2810 i know it's gonna 2810 and that's four through the middle you go oh okay so it took a while and i to be honest with you i, I i'm not sure that i ever really uh ever really got it um i mean i i, I bowled okay you know after that but but i don't think I, it ever fit my eye really that comfortably um, I'd never used a whole lot of strong layouts in bowling balls, uh, because I threw it slower and, uh, it was, I was a softer speed guy. I mean, I just, you know, I, my speed control was kind of medium, uh, to medium to normal, um, was kind of, so that would be my medium would be my hard. That would be my, as hard as I could throw it. And, uh, but I could throw it slower. <laughs> I mean, I, I could really throw it slow. Um, but going harder was always a little bit difficult for me because, um, I just, I never felt comfortable because I, when I went to throw it harder, I pulled it down from the top so hard that it became very just bad. I couldn't hit what I was looking at and it was tough. It was tough for me. So, um, I think growing up in that era, you know, I, I just threw it softer because I wanted to hook it. Yeah. And, I don't think I ever got better at throwing it harder. So in this period where you're touring, you have been a bowling center owner, a pro shop guy. Was there a goal for you early on to kind of do all the bowling things? Or was it simply, I want to be, you know, the best in the world? Are, are you following a dream here? Or do things just kind of end up happening this way? I I wanted to be in the industry. I wanted to be a, I wanted to make a difference in the industry. And, and I, I don't know that I really ever knew, uh, what that was going to be. Um, you know, I, I managed a bowling center, um, in, uh, in Charlestown, West Virginia, uh, for a couple of years for a group of, uh, businessmen. And, uh, the opportunity came along for me to, to buy my own center. And, uh, it was an, an unbelievable opportunity. Um, I didn't have any money 
and uh, I didn't have a dime. And uh, but it was a unique opportunity, and uh, and I moved to um, a little town in Virginia called Franklin, Virginia. Um, Dell actually ended up moving up there with us and uh, worked in the center with us. And uh, that's how he kind of got his start into the into the industry side of it. Um, he had this is th- this is Warren or Ballard? Del Warren. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Del Warren. And uh, he moved there um, and was uh, the manager, the assistant manager of the center and ran the pro shop. And uh, so he had kind of not been bowling much at all. Um, him and his wife, Dawn, actually got married up there in Franklin. And uh, and that's how he got ended up getting his job with AMF. Um, so he, he got recognized. Um, and uh, Mo Pinnell and a few other people were instrumental in helping him land this job at, at AMF. And he, he, he capitalized on it and has become you know, a very important person in our industry. Um, he was the president of track and, um, and now he's the, I don't exactly know what his title is now. President. I think, (laughs) no, I think he's vice president of Kegel and, uh, and he's, you know, he's, he's has had an unbelievable career, but, uh, his first, you know, real job after being on the pro bowlers tour was up there working with us, helping us get this bowling center going. And, uh, it was, it was a fun time. And, uh, um, we spent many years there, um, my wife and I, and, and, uh, the, uh, that just kind of happened. And, and, and I just, um, I don't know. It's just, I always just wanted to make a difference in bowling. I just wanted to make a difference. And, and, and however, however it happened, um, I started out in, in the, in the pro shop business down in Florida, I had some partners. I had uh, uh, Rob Comito was one of my partners and Mark Gelfan and uh, Storm DeVincent. And we had a great group. We owned several pro shops and uh, in the South Florida area. And uh, matter of fact, that's where I met my, my wife um, down there. And it was, uh, it was, it was, it was a fun time for me um, working down there in the South Florida, um, down the Fort Lauderdale area. And, uh, but then, uh, yeah, so I got a lot of pro shop experience and I learned a lot of things from a lot of those guys. And, but when I, when I got the bowling center, I thought that was going to be my thing. And, and, uh, but I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, we were there, I guess about 10 years, uh, 10, maybe about 10 years. I, I'd have to ask my wife to be sure, but, uh, it's been kind of a whirlwind. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I ended up getting this job at, uh, at track after I went back on tour after the bowling center, I went back and started to bowl again. And, uh, I, I just want to do it one more time. I want to give it another chance and, and, uh, see how I can do and see how I do. And, and, uh, I got on staff with track, um, Dell signed me on staff and, and, uh, so I went out there and I was bowling. I, it, I was bowling. Okay. And uh, I had a just a moment. Uh, I bowled unbelievably good in Wichita the first round, and then the second round I bowled absolutely terrible. And uh, and I uh, went from being one of the leaders after the first round to missing the cut. And uh, I remember calling my wife and going, you know, I just I don't want to do this anymore. I can't do this. I can't I can't ride this roller coaster. I'm just you know I'm not good enough. And uh, and it was very interesting that uh, Dell um, reached out to me and said, "Hey, you know, what, what about uh, helping the other players out a little bit, and and how about we transition you into this?" And, and that's kind of how the whole thing sort of started. And um, and then I ended up actually taking a job with them uh, at doing sales and doing some other things. So I've, I've been in the industry for a long time now, and I really enjoy. Uh, every aspect of it. People ask me all the time, what, what's your favorite part? I'm like, anything I can make a difference. Anything I can make a difference. Yeah. 
Were you surprised that he he saw that in you? You talked about Dell, uh, you know, telling you, "Hey, maybe you can help other players." Is that something that maybe he saw in you that you didn't, or did you know all along? Hey, I've got something to offer. I've got some advice to give, and some you know some real ways of helping competitive players that can make a difference that way. I, I truthfully think he saw it way before I did. Him and, and Brian Purcell. Um, Brian Purcell also, he, he worked for Columbia Industries at the time too. And um, they, they felt like I could, could make a difference and, and, and I would be helpful to the players um, because I had done it. I had the experience actually competing, but never succeeding um, where I wanted to succeed to. And uh, so I've dealt with all the frustrations and the ups and downs. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, I was always a pretty, well, I wouldn't say always. Um, <laughs> later on, I became a pretty positive person. I, I you know, believed in uh, some self-help books. I believe in, you know, trying to make sure you're, you're, you're trying to gain something from every experience. And, and I think that had something to do with it, too. So I think that was a, that was a fun and it was a fun time and I really enjoyed it. Um, I got to work with some great players um, at Columbia Industries, um, Wes Malott and, and Bill O'Neill's rookie season. Um, I got to work with Chris Barnes quite a bit, um, helped, helped him win his first major at the U.S. Open in New Jersey. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, so I, I've, I've, been really fortunate to work with some amazing talent uh, in my career, and uh, you know I, I I joke around a lot. People, I, I see a lot of people that take a lot of credit uh, for how people do in life, and uh, I tell people all the time. I said my, I, I don't take any credit for what I do um, because all I am is a sounding board. And, and if I help in some small way, it's great. But when someone gives me credit, they say, oh, you know, Chuck helped me with this or Chuck helped me with that. I tell them all the time, like, yeah, I'm fine tuning a Maserati or a Ferrari. I'm not I'm not working on a Yugo here. This is, <laughs> this is one of the best that's ever held a bowling ball. And uh, if I see one little thing that all of a sudden makes it click again for them, well, that's great. But that doesn't mean that I'm a great coach. It means that I'm I've been in the right position and, and, uh, I've gained some trust and some, and, and some confidence from some of our players and, and every once in a while I get to help them. You, uh, talked a little earlier on about how, you know, getting on board with Brunswick was a big thing because Brunswick has this, you know, this iconic name in bowling. Tell me about, you know, about starting to do the job with Brunswick. What was that like for you? Was it easy to adapt? Were there differences between, you know, working for Columbia Track and Brunswick? Well, here's the way the job started at Brunswick. I, I actually took a job with them as a sales rep. Um, and I was going to be, the, I was the sales rep for the Southeast. And, uh, but they also asked me to help Rick Benoit at the majors. So they would have a second rep at the big events. So at the majors, the world series and, and things like that, they wanted to have a second rep there. So that's how it started with them. I, I was a sales rep and then I would go out of my territory and, and work the majors with Rick. And it was valuable experience. I really enjoyed working with Rick a lot. And uh, I gained a lot of knowledge from Rick. Um, but at some point, Rick and Brunswick just decided they were going to go in a different direction. Um, and uh, then Brunswick, you know, wanted me to take over full time being the uh, the tour rep. And uh, and so that, yeah, it, it's definitely different. Um, I've had a few different bosses since I've been there. And, uh, you know, the different presidents of the company have had different expectations of, of how we do. Um, some of them were very, very focused on, um, you know, making sure that our staff was, uh, powerful and, and that we had, uh, you know, a, a staff that could win, you know, a lot. 
and then uh, some of the other losses have been more, you know, we want to just make sure we have great people that if uh, we want to send a, a pro to an event where we sold an install or we put in new lanes, that they're going to make the customer really happy and proud that they bought Brunswick. So it's been a, it's been a very different um, difference in philosophies. Um, and I've understood from a long, long time ago um, that my job is to fall in line with the philosophies of the leadership of the company and, and do the very best I can. And sure. that's what I've done. And um, that's, it, it's, it's really been rewarding. We've, you know, won several U S opens with players uh, both on the male side and the female side. Um, and uh, some big events, uh, lots of major titles. And uh, so there's been a lot of success and, 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 and some heartache too, obviously. Yeah. Um, Dasha had mentioned, uh, you know, that you always know what to say when she's feeling down and anxious and not sure of herself and uh, that you put up with her mood swings and self-confidence struggles, uh, but that you also allow her to be herself, whether it's her joking, being silly, slightly inappropriate. Uh, you're okay with that. You're very understandable and patient. Is there a lot of psychology and, and things like that that go into what you do? Yes. And, 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 and the important thing to understand is every player is different. Okay. Every player is different. Um, you know, some players, they just want your opinion and why you think this is going to work. Uh, other players, you need to, uh, you need to explain to them why this is your opinion and why you think this will work. Some other players struggle with self-confidence and belief in themselves. And so your job is to get them in a position where they can execute and make the shots they need to make, um, even when they're doubting themselves. So every player is different. Every player looks at it differently. And uh, we've had some, actually a little bit of growing pains this year um, on the ladies tour, um, trying to figure out exactly how to, uh, to best work with some of the girls that came over in the Ebonite purchase, the EBI purchase. Um, Cause some of these girls, I didn't really know their game very well. And so this is our first full season together, our first season together, because they didn't bowl in 2020 because of COVID. So we've had some growing pains and we're trying to learn each other and we're trying to figure out, you know, what makes them tick and, 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 and gain confidence. Um, really proud of, you know, like Missy Parkins had a, a really stellar year, made a bunch of shows this year. She hasn't won yet, but I know she's going to. Uh, we still have three events left. I know she's going to win. She's worked so hard. And, uh, you know, Clara Guerrero, uh, uh, Shannon O'Keefe has had an unbelievable year. Um, she's right up there for the player of the year thing again. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, her and Dasha are first and second um, in the player of the year race on the PWBA tour. So it's uh, so but we've had some growing pains and and. And we haven't found the exact fit yet, um, um, like for the other the other person to be at the events. Uh, Eric Eric Krause has done a really great job um, the last couple years, um, kind of coming into this position, um, and he's done a really really good job. Mike Wolf has done a really good job this year at a few of the ladies' events with me. Um, it's 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 really been a lot of fun to work with Mike and and Eric and and just trying to figure out what the future holds and and where we go um, and how we how we best uh, take care of our customer our, our our players and and help them have the most success they can have. I mean, we we've had an unbelievable year. Um, yeah. You know, from when you look at the size of our staff versus the size of Storm, it's it's not even you know they. They had they had fifty some girls at the uh, at the U.S. Open, and uh, and we had sixteen. So you know, thrilled that we we you know Shannon Pulowski made the show, but our girls were, you know, Shannon O'Keefe was sixth. Uh, one of our other players I think was seventh. So we're we're right there, and you know, and I'm 
you know, we're, we're really growing uh, as far as uh, connecting with the players and it's getting there. And, and I think having an off season where we can actually um, have a camp and get all the girls in, all the guys in for their, before their tour starts and get to know them better. Um, I think it'll help. Yeah. Um, Jerry Mars is coming on the show next week, credits you uh, for helping him a lot to where he's gotten in bowling. Um, you know, he said he was very grateful about that. And that the first time you met him, uh, he knew that he wanted to be a DV8 staffer. He was in New Jersey. Uh, he said you had told him that uh, you wanted to sign him, but couldn't because of budgets and such. Uh, and then after he got home from the Masters, you and Ron Bragg offered him a regional staff contract. Was that something that, you know, you knew, again, that you wanted him, you just couldn't? Or did he have to show you something? Um, I, probably a little bit of both. Um, yeah. But most of it, it really was, it was a budget thing at the point, at that point. Um, but you know what? I, listen, I, I want to make sure that my interactions with a, a player, whether they're on our staff or not on our staff, or they're a positive interaction. I, w I want people to leave there and go, you know what? Someday I'm going to drill a Brunswick ball, or I might want to be on Brunswick staff someday because that guy Chuck was nice to me. And that guy Chuck actually cared about what I was talking to him about. And that's how our interaction started. I, I, he, I think he was asking me a question about uh, a layout or about some ball strategy or some lane play strategy um, at the tournament there in, in New Jersey. And I, I think I just helped him out and just said, Hey, this is what I think. And, uh, but I want to make sure that when people leave an interaction with, with myself, and I try to ex express that to every person that works for Brunswick, like, when, when someone leaves an interaction with you, they should feel good about it. They should feel that that person actually cared what they had to say and that they that the interaction when they left there was a positive thing that they'll hold Brunswick in, in a positive light based on their interaction with you. So, Yeah. Um, he also said when he had his heart attack, you were one of the first ones to contact him and, and see how he was. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't do that. Uh, you know, it, do you consider that part of the job or is that something that just kind of speaks to the nature of who you are or have become? Yeah, I think it's more of who I've become. I, I, I'm not necessarily sure it's who I've always been. Um, if, you know, um, the, the people that have known me for a long time, um, they're, you know, they're, I've had a huge change in, in my, in my behavior and my, the way I go through life. Um, uh, my son had a really terrible accident, um, about 15 years ago, um, fell off the third story of a building and, uh, it was a work accident and, uh, we almost lost him. And, and it, you, when something like that happens to you, it, it makes you really reevaluate how you interact with other people and, and what kind of a, what kind of person you want to be and what kind of a role model you want to be in life. And, and I think, uh, I, I really believe that that incident changed me, um, so much for the better. It's, it's not even like, there's no way that my wife would still be putting up with me all these years later, um, had that accident not happened. Um, because I was I was a piece of work, so I I, I just think that uh, so I, I think it's more of who I've become, not yeah. not who I've always been, and uh, and 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 deep down inside, it, it kind of is a little bit part of the job, but it's not. You know, I I I want good for everybody, not just our players. But if something happens to one of our players, I'm really concerned, um, not just because of their bowling ability, but because they're part of our family. Um, I look at the Brunswick team as, as a family and uh, the players, you know, we're, we're very close and we're a close knit group and we have been for a long time. And, and, uh, and, and I, I hope it continues. Yeah. Not everybody agrees that tour reps, ball reps should be what they are in today's sport. 
Um, I had Barry Asher come on the show in June, and I want to play you a video. It's actually kind of audio because we had a, a connection problem, but okay. here's what he had to say about that. Of course, now they have ball reps, which yep. I'm, I'm opposed to ball reps. Oh, yeah? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, how come? Uh, because I think the, guy, the best bowlers are the best bowlers, mm-hmm. and I think that after the practice balls are over, that guy, those guys should leave the building. Hmm. Okay. That's let them bowl on their own. Let them make their equipment choices and and do that. And you, we didn't have scouts to go down and check out the next pair. Mm-hmm. And if you're a better bowler, you get more attention. Sure. It's just the way it is. Oh, I'm on the senior tour. Oh, Barry, how many balls do you want? <laughs> what do you mean? I, haven't, I haven't thrown a ball yet for sure. Oh, that's okay. Everybody wants to give you bowling balls. Oh, oh Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm just I, – I, ball reps are important practice, laying out equipment for them. But when the bell rings, they've got to be on their own. When the bell rings, do they have to be on their own? I mean, they don't really have to be on their own right now, but does he bring up a valid point? He does. He brings up a valid point. There's no question about it. Um, do, I, do I 100% agree with him? No, because and, – and it's not because I want to keep my job. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can find another job, and I'm pretty sure Brunswick would find something for me to do. Um, but I, I think it's – we saw when the PBA eliminated the tour reps being in the building, and they did that for several years, and I was working then, um, and you were not allowed to – well, they didn't never made, actually made you leave, but you couldn't communicate with the players. Um, so what happened is we went through a stretch, in my opinion, of bowlers not learning as much as they should have learned to become the next great players. And I think that reps have a big part in that. And and when you and and not. I will tell you, I really agree with him about the scouting pairs. I, I, if there's a part of my job that I don't like, that's it. I hate it. I, I not only do I, I, I really don't like that part of the job. Um, two reasons, and, and it's pretty simple, because I don't think everybody gets their pair scouted for them. So it's a competitive reason. And the second reason is when I go down and scout a pair and I tell them that it looks like the right lane hooks two or three more than the left lane and I'm basing it on where the players are playing that you're going to follow and then you throw a shot and you think it's wrong, Mm -hmm. I I really don't want to hear any guff from you i i I don't want to hear it like i'm telling you that the player was standing three boards further left with his feet and crossing two boards further left at the arrows than he is on the left lane that is fact i watched it now you want to debate with me that now it doesn't hook that much more for me it actually hooks less for me okay now you're just being contrary everybody's different i don't even know what you're being and that's true everybody is different but friction is friction Mm -hmm. so if a lane hooks more it generally hooks more um so so those are the two reasons that i absolutely despise that part of the job um because i'm out here trying to help and you happen to throw it two miles an hour harder on the right lane because you think it hooks more and you don't want to really want to move your feet, but you want to make sure you don't really cut it short. So you want to make sure you get through it and then you overthrow it. It never hooks. And now your tour rep gets blessed out. I've, I've heard it now. That hasn't happened to me too many times. Just saying doesn't yeah. happen to me too many times because usually once you've done it to me once, we're going to talk about it. Sure. Um, but I, you know, we're going to talk about it. We're going to go, listen, I'm a resource for you. 
I'm here to help you. Why would I give you bad information? Why would I do that? My goal is for you to bowl as well as you possibly can every week. That's my goal. To have as many Brunswick bowling people on television and having a chance to win titles as we possibly can. So why would I give you bad information? So let's just get on the same page here and let's figure it out. Yeah. So, but you know, I'm, I'm hundred percent with Barry on that. I really am. But I think the education thing is, is important. I, I think they, how do they understand if you don't give them ideas and you, okay, well, I think we need a ball that transitions quicker. So we need a quicker ball. So let's, let's get a ball that's a little quicker and let's see if that moves that target. If it, if it changes the difference in the lanes a little bit, makes it not as different. And uh, so they learn from that. And then the next time they can make that decision on their own or after they've seen it a few times, they can make those decisions on their own. Because if you think about in Barry's day, um, you could have bowled on tour for a much longer period of time before you ran out of money than you could today. And there was way more events to bowl. We used to bowl 35 events a year. 35 events a year. We went from week to week to week to week and bowling every week. We would finish the TV show would be on Saturday afternoon. We'd start the on Monday again. So it was every week. It was every week, every week. So you could get in rhythm and figure things out. Well, we don't bowl that way anymore. The tour doesn't work that way anymore. You know, you, you have the ladies tour. How, how do you get in rhythm? You know, they bowl on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And, and then through July, we didn't bowl at all. So in the men's tour, like they, they have two or three events in a row, and then they don't bowl for a month. And then they have, you know, the World Series of Bowling and, and something else. So it, it's just, it's a different sport now. It's different. So you can't learn and get in that rhythm and, and figure it out and, you know, just, so it's, it's just different. It's just yeah. different. Um, Nicole DePaul was uh, the one who challenged you to, to be here. Uh, you know, she's mentioned that you represent Brunswick with, with class and supports players from all levels, uh, your wife, Deborah, and you have done a lot for youth bowling. And I think a, a big part of that has got to be Bowl for Life. So what is Bowl for Life? And, uh, and you know, how did you start it? And what's it all about? Well, Bull for Life has, has morphed into what it is today from something that we did a little thing in, I think it was 2012. Um, in 2012, I think was the first year. And we had a, uh, <laughs> we had a, we have three. I'm pulling pro out shops. all the stops here. <laughs> yeah. We have, we have three pro shops. And so what we did is we had a tournament at each of the three bowling centers where kids could earn their way on to this, this team. It was a team and each center had their own team coached by the pro shop managers and they would compete against each other. So, and it was all Baker style bowling. So once you made the team qualifying was, was regular bowling in the tournaments, but then all the finals, all, all the finals were all Baker. So we're trying to teach them a little bit about how to bowl Baker you know, they're going to go bowl in high school and hopefully on to college. So that's how it started. And, and, and it was neat. It was a lot of fun. We had, we had a great time with the teams and the kids. Um, but I, I felt like we wanted to do more. And so we reached out to uh, some potential sponsors within the industry and, and figured we were going to start to do scholarships and we we're going to do scholarships based on, uh, um, based on um, not not skill level. I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here, but it's, it has nothing to do with your bowling ability. Um, we don't give scholarships out based on bowling ability. It's, on, it's a, um, you know, it's a, uh, I'm just drawing a blank. Um, is it hard work? Is it improvement? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard work. It's what you do for the, for your community. 
um, we, we give them an essay. Every single scholarship is based on an essay first. And they say why they would do, like right now the essay is, uh, uh, I think it's who got you started bowling and why, when or something like that. Um, so they, 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 it's all done through essays. Um, my wife's chiming in and being a good person. Yeah, that's, that's really <laughs> important. Um, so I, I think, I think if the, we, we just wanted to make a difference and give out scholarships. I think the first year we gave, uh, um, we gave away, I think $12,000 in scholarships and it's grown every year. And, uh, we're going to give away a hundred thousand dollars this year in scholarships wow. um, to kids to go to college. Um, we, it is a 501 C three. It is a, the charity, every single, Deb said 11,000, I guess we gave away the first year, 11,000. <laughs> so she'll keep me straight. Yeah. Um, so the, every dime that comes into the, into the foundation, every dime gets given away in scholarships, every dime. There's not a penny taken out of anything. Um, my family and I fund the whole thing ourselves. Um, we have sponsors that help fund the scholarships, but everything else that we, we fund. So every, if someone donates $500 to the Bowl for Life Foundation, that entire $500 is given to some child to help them go to college every dime. Huh. So we've been very fortunate. We have a lot of great sponsors and people that help us. And, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, we, we, we support a lot of other tournaments. Um, we gave away $3,000 at, uh, Parker's event, uh, this week. Um, Parker Bone had their, his 26th annual Parker Bone scholarship tournament. We gave away 3000 to his tournament. We're giving away, uh, money at Danny Wiseman's tournament. Um, um, Billy Gasson's tournament, we gave away money there. Um, from out near your way, Nevin Breed, um, he he has an event. We give away money at his event, uh, the Hawaii Bowlers Tour. So we we participate with a lot of these tournaments, and we give money to them to give away for scholarships too. And all of those are luck of the draw, every one of them. So Parker's event this week. We gave them $3,000. They gave 15 kids $200 a piece. So 15 kids that may or may not have cashed at all in the tournament. Every kid got a coupon and it went into a, a bucket and they just drew them out. Wow. They just drew them out. And, and and that's the way we like to do those that, because then we don't, because the person who bowls the best, they're going to get the most money already. Yeah. So why not give it to someone who doesn't bowl the best or doesn't, so that's that's kind of how we've always based it on on the essays and and on just being great people and um, my family works really hard at this deal because uh, I don't I, you know, I don't have that much time and um, so you know my daughter and and son and son-in-law daughter-in-law and Deb they they put in so much time and and effort into this thing and um, and it's it's just a joy. It's it's a joy to, to do it. We're um, just we're blessed to be able to do it because because of all the help of the sponsors. Yeah, no, that's that's a great thing, and I applaud you for you know for both taking that on and maintaining it for all this time. Um, the one other thing Dasha said is that she always jokes around that you're going to retire because of her, but she hopes that that won't be the case. Uh, what does the future hold for you, both in will say, uh, you know, at Brunswick as a tour rep in bowl for life in the sport in general? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I'll be honest with you. I don't know. Um, bowl for life is going to continue to grow and, and live on. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty darn positive. I'm still going to be part of the Brunswick team. Um, but you know, it, I'm 62 and, uh, you know, 200 nights a year in a hotel is tough on a 62 year old man. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I don't know. Um, we're going to talk here in a couple weeks. I'm going to Muskegon and, uh, we're going to sit down and, and, and discuss the, uh, 
you know, well, I've told Brian and Corey and Bugsy um, since they've been there. Um, I mean, Corey can't start at about the same time I did. He's the president of Brunswick and, and uh, Brian Graham came in, you know, well after and, and Bugsy's only been there a few years. And I've told them all along, um, as long as I feel like I can contribute and I'm making a difference, I want to do something. I want to be part of it. Um, but in 2019, they had, we had kind of come up with this new role for me and, and we were going to, I was going to be doing some other things and doing some, um, like an ambassador kind of position and, uh, speaking and, and doing some things that, that they feel that I'm, you know, equipped well enough to, to do and, and to represent the company. Um, and then COVID hit and, uh, you know, we had hired Mike Wolf as to, to become the tour rep and, uh, and him and Eric, were going to do it together. And, uh, but then COVID hit and, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, we went through some tough times as a company and like all companies did. And, uh, I went back to, you know, doing the tour deal and, um, and, and I, I've really enjoyed it. We've, I've, we've had a great, um, year and a half on the men's tour and this, this year on the ladies tour has been fantastic. Um, I mean, Jen Higgins got her first win. Beer got her first win. Dasha's had two wins. Shannon's had a win. Um, Missy's made a whole bunch of shows. And um, I think Missy and Dasha have made the most shows of anybody. I think they I think they both have six or Dasha might have six and Missy has five. And it's been really a great year. And, and uh, I love being with the ladies. They're a lot of fun. Um, but getting on a plane every single Wednesday and – and flying home, you know, every Sunday and it's, 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 it's tough. It's tough. So, so I don't know, I'm going to do whatever they really want me to do. Um, so we're going to, we're going to talk, um, in two weeks, I'm going to Muskegon, have a little sit down with them and I'll know better than what my future holds with Brunswick. Um, uh, but I feel like, um, I don't even own a article of clothing that doesn't say Brunswick on it. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll, you know, be with the company um, forever. Yeah. And uh, like, like Johnny and Parker and, you know, some of the, some of the uh, other old guys on the team. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll see what happens though. Yeah. The one thing I want to ask you before we get to the comments and the, you know, off the sheet and all that stuff if there's somebody watching who is interested in finding out, you know, what they need to do to make it on a staff, to, you know, to up their marketability in the sport um, through one of the ball companies, be it Brunswick or somebody else, what would you tell them? I would tell them, first of all, um, be a great person. Um, I, I, you know, we need more Adam Bartas in the world. Um, we need more great people in this world and, uh, we need more people that just represent the brands, uh, wonderfully. Um, make sure that every time you have an interaction with someone that it's a positive interaction and they leave, they're going, and I'm, that guy represents the company in the right way. I think that's first and foremost, the most important thing. Um, but I will tell you what the sales guys look for. Um, the sales guys look for people that are going to make a difference in all sales. And, you know, part of that has to do with, you know, it, it's a fine line, right? You, you're a competitive bowler. Um, your job when you're out bowling is to beat the guy you're bowling against, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you're bowling for a title. I, I don't care what title it is. It doesn't matter. But you need a double in the 10th to win, and you get up and you throw two great shots and you beat them. How you handle that, how you handle that makes all the difference in the world. And, you know, not many people can get away 
with handling that poorly and stay with a company for a long time. Now, there's been some. We can name a few. Yep. And I'm not going to, but we can name a few. <laughs> and and, and they, they're there because, you know, they've always been great. Uh, they have some sort of a personal relationship with somebody at the company. Uh, a promise was made. Something was said. Somehow they're still there, even though they don't make a whole lot of friends when they're competing. Um, I, I, I think being a great person is the number one thing, though. I, I really do believe that. Um, figure out a way that people are going to be attracted to you and ask your advice. They're going to ask for your input. People are going to ask you why you do certain things, why this, why that. That all helps the brand. That all helps the brand because that gives you an opportunity to talk to those people about your favorite ball, about why you throw this ball, why you do this. And there's a chance that they're going to go buy that ball. I don't think it's about winning everything. I don't, I just don't believe that. I just don't believe that. I think it's more about how you, how you treat other people. I really believe that. Yeah. I'd say, yeah, you're a reflection of your company, be it in the working world or in the bowling world. And that's, uh, that's sage advice for sure. Uh, let me get to some of these comments. I mean, you know, your wife did a great job of, you know, kind of keeping up with this in real time, the essay and being a good person and, you know, two wishes and 11 K, uh, Jerry said, hello. Um, you know, hey, wants to know, wants to know how's it, how it's going. It's going great. <laughs> going yeah. great. Having a fun time tonight. Yeah. I can't yeah. wait to watch your show. <laughs> that's coming up in, a, in another week but uh you know before we talk about that we got to go off the sheet and that's where we ask you to challenge somebody else in bowling and again skill level is kind of out the window we're talking about somebody who is passionate about the sport and has a great story to tell so chuck gardner who would you like to challenge to be on a future episode of bowling with the feth del warren okay del warren without a doubt I think I think it would be, I think you would get a you, your your uh, viewers would enjoy it. Um, I think uh, he he brings a lot to the table. Um, I would also like to, to get Parker Bone on. Okay. Um, Parker is um, just a tremendous human being. Um, one of the one of the finest people I've ever known in my life, and. Uh, um, I think having Parker on would be a really good thing. Okay. Well, Dell and I have been in contact. He's he's agreed to come on, so we are definitely going to have him on. He's up for the challenge. Uh, Parker has now been challenged twice. I might need your help to you know to maybe get that message to him. But uh, Parker, if you do see this, uh, you can find me on Facebook. Direct, direct message me there. Email me at bowlingwiththefeff at yahoo.com. We would love to have you on. Uh, as you mentioned, Jerry Mars is coming up. Uh, the next live stream on Tuesday, September 14th at uh, 6 p.m. Central. Uh, and we're really looking forward uh, to that. Um, you know, great comments from him for this one. And, uh, you know, I've had some nice chats with him uh, about the show and about bowling in general. So, uh, yeah, really looking forward to that episode. Um, Chuck, if anybody wants to know how to get more information about Bowl for Life, be it on the sponsorship end, on the competitive bowling side, what should they do? Just reach out to us at www.bowlforlife.com, and uh, my wife will be more than happy to get back with you and um, give you every kind of option. I mean, we we just we just want help. We just we we want to we want help helping the kids. Um, and the other thing that's really easy for people to help, really easy, is when you order on Amazon. Go to Amazon Smiles and pick the Bowl for Life, Chuck Gardner Bowl for Life Foundation, and uh, and they donate to our foundation every time you order, if you order under Amazon Smiles, and it does not cost you a dime, it doesn't cost it doesn't cost a, a anything for you to help support a charity, and uh, we'd like it if you would support the Bowl for Life Foundation. Um, that way, we can give more money away to kids. Yeah. Because it's it's hard. It's you know it's easier today than it was back in the day. 
to go to college. There's actually scholarships for for bowling now, but it's still it's still difficult. It's still a, a hardship for the families. And and if we can help, you know, my goal is someday to be able to fund a couple of kids full tuition for for their entire college career. Um, I, I'd love to do that. I would love to do something like that. And, uh, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's our next thing. Uh, our goal was really to get to a hundred thousand dollars this year. And, uh, we're getting, we're, we're going to get there easily. Um, and, uh, I just, uh, I'm, I'm proud of our foundation and I'm proud to give back to the sport that I love so much. Yeah. Super worthy cause. And like I said, kudos to you and your family on all the work you do uh, for that cause. Chuck Gardner, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm so glad we were able to do this and uh, that Nicole challenged you. And uh, best of luck with Brunswick and moving forward on uh, however that looks uh, from here on out. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, I, I really, really love what you do. I, I think it's Thank great. Um, any way we can get the word out about our sport and, and learn more about the characters that are in our sport. I think it's, uh, I think it's important and, uh, really lots of thanks to, uh, Brent and Dasha and Jerry and, and Dell and everybody that made, you know, such nice comments. I appreciate it very much. And thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to do it. Um, uh, I guess that's the end of our show. So be just and fear not. We'll see you again next week for Bowling with the